How can one man say all the right words and still be so completely wrong? That's a question that we're left with after we read this section of Mark's gospel with Peter and Jesus finding themselves in striking conflict. The conflict emerges after Jesus starts asking questions. That's the sort of thing he does. In particularly, he challenges his followers with the question of his identity. Who do you say that I am? And Peter starts out so well. And he's right. You're the Messiah. Some of your translations may say you're the Christ. Talk more about that in just a minute. Either way, Peter gets the question right. Who is Jesus? He's the Messiah. He's the anointed one. He's the Christ. He's the one God has sent to rescue us. But within moments, Peter's rebuking Jesus, and Jesus is rebuking Peter. To the extent that Jesus will use some of the strongest language we find in the whole Bible against this one who is one of his closest friends. How does this guy get all the right words and miss all the meaning? To understand how we got to this place, we've got to step back a little bit and consider the question that Peter was answering. Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? That one question matters most. That's the question that drives the story and If you take the whole gospel into account, all the way through Mark chapter 1 through chapter 16, that question is really a turning point in the narrative. Up until this point, the disciples, like, they don't get it. They don't get everything, but they're doing okay. Like, they're learning some things. They've spent some time with Jesus. They're getting teaching that no one else is getting. Like, everybody else gets some stuff that they find confusing. They go inside a house. Jesus, they're like his inner circle. He explains the hard stuff to them. Like, so things are going well. It feels pretty good. But from this point forward, after this conflict between Jesus and Peter, and by implication, all the other disciples, things get really bad for the disciples. Like earlier in this point, they could heal people, cast out demons. But in chapter 9, shortly after this conflict, They're not able to do that anymore. They can't cast out demons anymore. In chapter 10, we find them arguing. And what are they arguing about? Which one of us is the greatest? A lot of humility, a lot of Christ-like humility there. These guys are a mess. Things just get darker and darker and darker for them. And it's not just the way they relate to each other. It's the way they relate to other people who are in ministry. They come upon this guy who's casting out demons. They've just learned they can't do that anymore. And so what do they do if this guy's casting out demons in Jesus' name? Stop it right now. (laughs) That's our job, not yours. They're in darkness. They don't get it. And in that same part of the narrative, we find James and John selfishly asking Jesus, when you come to your kingdom, can one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left? They don't know what they're asking. They don't realize that when Jesus comes to his kingdom, there will be dying men at his left and right. They're assuming he's going to be on a throne, and they would like to be secretary of state and vice president. Again, the selfishness of their heart is the thing on display. So up until this point, it's been pretty good. They're in ministry. They got a lot of wins. Their ministry reports are really exciting. But up after Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? They are self-oriented, selfish, self-focused men. And they are portrayed negatively 
and with increasing darkness. Everything falls apart for these guys. And the turning point is this passage we've just read. And this question Jesus has asked. So this question, who do you say that I am, relates to the whole story. And that's where we are going to kind of let our thoughts settle for a moment. As we begin to realize the way we answer this one question will define every other moment in our lives. We'll call that the bottom line today. There'll be one of those every week. The way we answer this one question, who do you say that I am, doesn't just make a difference in the moment the question is asked. Every moment of our lives from that point forward is defined by the way we answer that question. Now, to, if we're gonna wrestle with that, understand it, we've gotta take a look at this text. And the text raises more than one question. That one question is the most important question. But we've got Jesus. He and his 12 disciples are traveling, as they did. They're on their way to a village called Caesarea Philippi, a collection of villages around, the, around it. And as they're going, Jesus starts asking them questions. He doesn't begin by asking them what, who they think he is. First, they, he kind of asks them about, like, what are the rumors? What are people saying? Like, you guys are out there. You've been going out on mission. You've heard what people are saying. Like, what are they saying about who I am? What's the word on the street? And the disciples have got some information for him, don't they? Well, some people say you're John the Baptist. Yeah, we know he got killed, but maybe, like, you're John the Baptist back to life. And other people are saying, well, it's more like Elijah or one of the other prophets. Like, that's a big deal, isn't it? All of a sudden... The great prophets from the Old Testament are coming back. Jesus is like, all right, that's good. We got that. That's helpful to know what people are saying. But I've got another question. And he looks right, you you can imagine, he looked right at these guys. Maybe he looked right at Peter. Who do you say that I am? And all of a sudden, the moment intensifies. Like this isn't, What are the rumors? What's the word on the street? It's what are you going to do with what you've discovered about me? Who do you say that I am? And Peter pipes up. We're not surprised by that. This guy's always trying to go first, isn't he? Frequently gets himself in trouble. I kind of, Peter resonates with me. I appreciate this guy. He'll speak up, and then he's got to, like, walk it back and just figure it out. He's kind of like talk first, think later guy, right? you got to love him. You're the Messiah! Some of your translations, we said, may say the Christ. What's behind that? Messiah is the Hebrew word for anointed one. Christ is the Greek word for anointed one. So it just depends on... Uh, which one they're following there. But you get the idea that Peter's saying, like, you're the guy that God has sent. Like, you're the one God picked, and he sent here to us to rescue us, to redeem us, to, to save us. You're the guy. You're the Messiah. You're the anointed one of God. And, it, it, like, he gets that right. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the one that God has sent to save his people. And then Jesus says something surprising. I think it's surprising. He says, don't tell anybody. Now you hear us around here, we're like, let's tell everybody. (laughs) Like That's what we do. We're the church. We tell people about Jesus. Yet here we are, and Peter's in this situation where he just, he gets the answer right. All of a sudden, Jesus is like, shh. We'll understand that better in just a second, but let the counterintuitive nature of that instruction sit with you for a second. You're the Messiah. Don't tell anyone. And then Jesus begins to teach. Here's what that means. He calls himself the Son of Man, which comes from the book of Daniel. It's one of the names that Jesus used for himself. In Daniel, that title was associated with the Messiah. Like when the Messiah comes, we're going to call him son of man. So that's a way of Jesus affirming that he gets the title right. 
And so he teaches, like, what does that look like? What does it mean to be the Messiah? Jesus says, well, it means I'm going to undergo great suffering. Okay. I'm going to be handed over to the power players in Jerusalem. Elders, priests, scribes. I'm going to die. They're going to kill me. And then after three days, I'll be raised from the dead. And we're sitting here and we're thinking, right? Like, yeah, that's, that's the gospel. Jesus died for us and was raised for us. That's the good news. We talk about it. We celebrate it. We proclaim it. All the stuff. But Peter doesn't respond with celebration, does he? Peter doesn't go, yeah, the gospel, Jesus died and was raised. That's great. Priority. First things first. No, Peter says, Jesus, come over here. Verse 32, Jesus has said all this openly. Peter takes him to the side and began to rebuke him. I don't know if you've ever rebuked Jesus or not. Don't tell us if you have. It seems like a really bad idea to me. But that's exactly what Peter does. Now, what's going on? Like, he's just said you're the Messiah, which means you're the king, you're in charge, you're God's anointed person. He's just, Jesus has just explained the gospel. <laughs> I'm going to be, I'm going to suffer and be handed over and die for you and be raised from the dead. And Peter, like there's a disconnect. Even though he said the right words, he rebukes Jesus. What does he not understand? What does he not get? We know the Messiah is supposed to die for us and be raised. Why does Peter rebuke Jesus for saying something like that? Well, if we're going to understand that, we need a little history. If you're a history buff, this is for you. If you're not, it's still for you. We've got to rewind 167 years or so before Jesus was born. Still in Jerusalem. But Rome wasn't the foreign oppressor of that day. There was a different guy. I'm going to say his name. You don't have to remember this, okay? He was from northern Egypt, and his name was Antiochus Epiphanes IV. Get that straight, because there were several of them. The fourth. Antiochus comes rolling into Jerusalem and takes over. People were constantly doing that, and he was just the, the dominator of the day. When he got there, he wanted to really show the disregard he had for the people and their religion. So he, a non-Jewish Gentile, got himself a pig. You know this is already going badly. In Judaism, pigs were about as unclean as it gets. So Antiochus gets himself a pig takes that pig and goes marching into the temple in Jerusalem. He didn't stop in the courtyard. He went all the way into the holiest place, to the sanctuary. Guess what he did there? He threw that pig on the altar and sacrificed it to his God, not to theirs. So you've got a foreign guy, a Gentile. They didn't get to come into that space. Their very presence, like, they would kill you if you came that far and you weren't Jewish. This guy comes in, unclean himself, with an unclean animal, spills its blood all over God's altar, desecrating the entire place and mocking the Jewish people, sacrificing to what they considered was a false god. Nice guy, right? Kind of want to go have lunch and hang out a little bit, I'm sure. You can imagine he wasn't making friends. Very quickly, the Jewish people began to think, try to figure out how they could overcome this guy. Like, this guy's got to go, and we've got to recover our sacred space. Takes a few years, but when we get around to 164, I believe it is, 
a guy named Judas Maccabeus. Lots of Judases in like in the Bible and in Jewish history. This one, Judas Maccabeus, was a priest, rather a feisty priest. His nickname was the Hammer, not because he was into construction, but because when he went into battle, a hammer was his weapon of choice. Judas Maccabeus gets up a posse, and they go to war against Antiochus and his armies. They practice guerrilla warfare, because you know a bunch of untrained priests <laughs> are probably not going to handle a full-on invading army. So they got creative, but they also developed momentum. And they came to the point when the battle came to a head, they won. Antiochus was defeated. The pagans were kicked out of Jerusalem and they cleansed the temple. Remember, it had been defiled. They had a party, massive celebration. God had sent someone to save them. He killed their enemies, and he sanctified the temple. He made it holy again. The celebration is one you've probably heard of. It's still observed by observant Jews. It's called Hanukkah celebrating the Festival of Lights when the Maccabean revolt kicked the bad guys out of Jerusalem. That's the sort of Savior Peter was looking for. So when Jesus says, we're going to go to Jerusalem where Rome has, its, has taken over, and I'm going to die, in Peter's head, that doesn't compute. Jesus, I just got the words out of my mouth. <laughs> you ever say that to Jesus? You're the Messiah. You're the chosen one. That means we go to Jerusalem. It doesn't mean you die. It means you kill people. Do we need to do a little history? <laughs> you, you can imagine, like Peter's walking Jesus. Remember these other, like there are plenty, Judas Maccabees was only one. There were plenty of folks who kind of put themselves in this role. If they failed, if they died, it just means they weren't the Messiah. There's a rather well-known New Testament scholar who's kind of famous for saying, in this period, a dead Messiah was a false Messiah. And Jesus takes all of that and turns it on its head. I'm the Messiah. Here's what that means. I've got to die. I've got to suffer, and I've got to die, and I've got to be raised from the dead. And Peter's over there losing his mind because he's expecting a warrior king. That's why, remember when, when the soldiers come for Jesus? What does Peter do? Dude pulls out a sword and cuts off somebody's ear. Why? Why? because he was expecting a fight. Judas Maccabeus got his fight, where's mine? And so Jesus turns to Peter. <laughs> After Peter rebukes Jesus, Jesus turns and rebukes Peter. And he saves for Peter, one of his closest friends, some of the harshest language in the Bible. Get behind me, Satan. Your mind is marked by human perceptions, not God's perceptions. You're thinking like a human being. You're not thinking like God. And I'm stunned by the way Jesus talked to Peter because like, that kind of language only shows up one other time, and Jesus is actually talking to Satan. <laughs> like It's not hyperbole. It's like that's who he's talking to. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus is tempted in the wilderness. And you get the sense there that things are a little calmer. Get behind me, Satan. Man shall not live by bread alone. Like the, he's tempted, but he quotes some scripture, and it just kind of deals with that adversity. But it, there's not this sense of just rebuking back and forth and antagonism and conflict, right? So why does that kind like we expect that language to Satan himself? Why does Peter get called that? 
And I can't help but think when Jesus was tempted by Satan, Matthew chapter 4, the temptation was to betray his vocation to be the Messiah, wasn't it? You don't have to do it this way. You don't have to die. I'll give you all the kingdoms. You don't have to suffer. I'll provide. The temptation was a temptation to not be the Messiah God's way. And now the same temptation has resurfaced. Here's the thing. When the devil tempts you, it's easier to say no. Like, he's the bad guy, obviously. Right? But when someone you've walked with and traveled with, one who loves you, one you love, says, <laughs> it doesn't have to be that way. I think it's a little harder to say no and do the right thing. You bet it is. When Satan himself says, you don't have to suffer. Okay, we're not following you. But when your best friend says, you don't have to suffer. You feel the tension? You feel the strength? And this is one of those places where it's, it looks like Jesus' humanity is shining forward in ways that are really revealing. Because it's easy to think about Jesus is God. He heals people and he does miracles and feeds thousands of people and he's supernatural and, and he's, he's just walking around being God all over the place. And if we think about Jesus primarily that way, he is fully God, fully affirming that. Yes, yes, yes. But if that's primarily where we land, then it's easy to forget how he identifies with us. And there are places in the Gospels where you can feel his humanity on full display. Like, struggling here. You don't call your best friend Satan if you're not struggling with something. This is hard for him. He knows that the decision he makes this day leads straight to a garden where he will sweat drops of blood. If he can say, not my will, but yours be done, O oh, my Father in heaven, here, then it's taking him to a path where he'll say that in the garden, where his body will be broken and his blood will be shed. That's where this thing goes. And this point, this encounter with Peter is decisive. And Jesus is faithful beautifully faithful. In the tension, in the temptation, in the struggle, he's faithful. And that defines his ministry. Every moment, his faithfulness defines his ministry. You can feel the tension kind of coming down a little bit calls the crowd together. Maybe he, he and Peter kind of make their way back over to the group. Verse 34, Jesus calls the crowd and his disciples and says to them, you can feel there's a sense of calm now, maybe a little leftover, like this was intense for a minute, but let's, let's recover ourselves and continue the instruction. If anybody wants to become my follower, verse 34, let them deny themselves take up their cross, and follow me. This is wide open. This isn't just the 12. This is, this, is every, this is the crowds. This is us. Jesus himself is asking, anybody want to be my follower? Does anybody want to be his follower? I got one over there. All right. Just, anybody else? Like, we're good. Like, we're we're all, I thought, afraid I was in the wrong room for a second there. We want to be followers of Jesus, don't we? Like, that's why we're here. We're trying to figure this, like, we, we want to follow him. We're trying to learn what that means. And now he is telling us, you want to be my followers? Here's what it means. You say I'm the Messiah? Here's what it means. 
deny yourself. Say no to yourself. You got to lay something. If you want to be my followers, you have to lay something down. You have to lay down your self-determination. And we probably feel like they felt. They probably felt like we feel. I have to? I have to lay down my self-determination, my self-will. I have to lay down control of my life. That's a big ask, Jesus. That's a big ask. He ain't done. You got to lay something down. You also have to take something up. You have to take up a cross. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that that's meaningful to us, but it doesn't land for us the same way it landed for them. Because most of us haven't actually walked by a crucifixion before. In the ancient world, the Romans were masters of torturing people to death. And crucifixion was the worst way to die. They would embarrass you. They would shame you. This was reserved for traitors, slaves, citizens were typically spared this kind of capital punishment. It didn't get any worse. And the goal wasn't a humane death. The goal was, let's come up with the most dehumanizing death we can come up with. And we'll hang your dead body up on the street for a few days to shame you and discourage other people from doing the sort of thing you do. And Jesus picks that as the image of discipleship. Take up your cross. You gotta be willing to be ashamed for me, to experience shame for me. You gotta be willing to suffer for me if you're gonna be my followers. You've gotta be willing to offer me everything you can't hold anything back. Then you can follow me. That's the one who looks at us and says, who do you say that I am? I'm lingering here because I don't want it to be lost on us, the weightiness of this and the seriousness. You've learned over rec the recent weeks, I'm a big fan of John Wesley. Wesley has a sermon titled On Self-Denial. He's preaching on the, the version of this story from Luke's gospel, but it's the same encounter. I want to read to you a quote from Wesley's sermon. And the reason I want to read it to you, and the reason we've put it up there on the screen, it's long, it's intense. And for Wesley, like this quote will help you understand why he baked serious discipleship into the Methodist movement from day one. Everything depended on how much Jesus has of our hearts. So here's what Wesley says. He's talking about self-denial and its role in Christian discipleship, talking about this passage, conflict between Jesus and Peter. Self-denial is absolutely necessary in the very nature of the thing <laughs> to our coming after him and following him. So it's not kind of necessary. It's not mostly necessary. It is absolutely necessary. In so much that, as far as we do not practice it, we are not his disciples. I kind of wish he hadn't put it that way. Wesley says, if we do not continually deny ourselves, we do not learn of him, but of other masters. I shudder to think who they are. 
If we do not take up our cross daily, we do not come after him. But after the world, or of the prince of the world, or of our own fleshly mind. Not one to mince words, was he? Not a tickle your ears kind of preacher, was he? But he understood the gospel, didn't he? He understood what it meant to take up the cross and follow Jesus. It sounds horrifying. It sounds scary. If a PR person were doing a branding campaign, this is not the kind of thing they would want Jesus talking about. But Jesus knows the truth. Jesus knows that if we release our commitment to self-determination, we will find life. Abundant life. And joy. That's the next section, isn't it? He's like, you can hold on to it. Verse 35, those who want to save their life will lose it. You see this image of somebody who's just taking control of their life and gripping it and holding it. I'm going to have my way no matter what. I'm going to have my way no matter what. Me, I will do it. I will do it. And they squeeze control of their life harder and harder and harder. And you know what happens when they do. It slides out through their fingertips. Jesus wants Peter and John, all of us, to realize like the more we try to hold on to self-determination, self -con uh, to control, we lose everything. He says, if you can open your hands, if you're willing to lose your life and offer yourself to me, I'll give you everything you ever dreamed and more. It won't be what you thought. <laughs> but it'll be better than you could have imagined. And what we find is he gives us himself. That's what this table means. When you come to this table in a moment, Jesus is saying, I give you myself. My whole life, all that I am, I'm giving it to you for your life and your abundance and your flourishing and your wholeness. If you hold on to self-determination, you can't receive what I offer you. If you release your grip, I'll give you my life. All of it. It takes the release, though, doesn't it? And that's what Wesley's getting at. And Wesley understood, like, this is not a one and done kind of thing. This is a practice that Jesus wants us to develop. Take up your cross and follow me, not just today, not today and tomorrow, but every day, consistently, increasingly. And so we have to ask ourselves, like, what sort of pattern, if this is what it means to be the Messiah, if it means Jesus' life is marked by the shape of the cross, if that's what it means to be the Messiah, what does it mean to be a follower of the Messiah? What does that mean about the shape of my life? And it means the shape of Jesus' life comes to characterize the shape of all our lives, doesn't it? Like that's where he's going with this. So what does that look like? What does self-denial look like tomorrow morning? Or worse, tomorrow afternoon when you get off work and you're exhausted and don't want to be around anybody? And you and your spouse get home and the kids are antsy, and there's a bunch of dishes left over from the day before. And nobody wants to do that. What does self-denial look like in that moment? Does Jesus care about that? Like, it doesn't seem super significant, except it probably reveals where our hearts are, doesn't it? Our kids aren't small anymore, but if you've had small children in the house, 
you know that they wake up at night and screaming sometimes. Who's going to go? What does that have to do with the gospel, preacher? I think it has everything to do with the gospel. Are we willing to lay down our preferences for the sake of another? Those are things that probably seem kind of small in the grand scheme of things. Other times it's quite, quite a large thing. Wouldn't surprise me if there's somebody in the room who's heard about some of these mission trips people are on. Pretty sure the Lord has said, hey, you need to be on one of these. And we can offer every reason in the book and a few extras why we don't need to be on one of these, right? You're going to hold on to control or you're going to turn it loose? Wouldn't surprise me if there's somebody who has begun to sense that Jesus is calling them not to a short-term trip but to a long-term vocation on the mission field. You don't talk about mission as much as you all have been talking about mission for like decades now without that happening to at least one or two people, usually more. Maybe it's you. Maybe Jesus is saying, I want you to go. You've heard the testimonies. You've met people who win. I'm calling you. And again, there's that. (laughs) There's a lot of uncertainty there, Jesus. I'm afraid. Job change? Country change, maybe? Like, I don't think we're ready for that. And Jesus says, are you going to hold on to control or are you going to receive my life? The Lord Jesus Christ is looking at every one of us and asking one question. Who do you say that I am? The way we answer that question and what we mean when we answer that question defines every decision we make and every moment of our lives. There may be some who've never answered the question. Jesus has asked, Who do you say that I am? And you've been hesitant. (laughs) I'd rather not say yet because I know what you'll require. Brothers, sisters, it's time to answer the question. It's time to lay down control. It's time to receive life. You do not have to doubt his goodness. He set a table for you. Wherever we are, whether we're hearing the question for the first time or maybe Jesus is reiterating and inviting us to new levels of trust and a new experience of his grace, deeper experience. The question is the same. We're going to come to the table in a moment. You're going to have a chance to receive the bread and the cup. After you do, you'll have a chance to come and kneel at one of these altars. You're going to taste what love feels like. 
you're going to experience Jesus giving himself. What I wonder is, when you receive what he offers, is whether you can respond to that with open hands to say, Jesus, here's the thing I've been holding back. Whatever you call, whatever you ask for, I yield. I'm not going to hold out any longer. I surrender.